Thank you. I was thinking as I was, and we were worshiping, and just the entire evening was beginning, that it really wasn't that long ago that I would travel great distances to um, spend my own money to hear uh, great coaches talk about football and basketball and things like that. And then Lord Jesus Christ came into my heart and it wasn't long after that that I would travel great distances to hear uh, men of God uh, who could present the gospel uh, clearly and, and uh, with impact. But now that I've been with the Lord for 20 years or so, I've, I've learned a little bit. And uh, whereby at one time uh, football coaches were my heroes and then the great preachers were my heroes. Now my heroes are those of you in the city. I've learned and matured and grown and traveled just enough to know who the real saints are. And um, it's really an honor for me to be here in your company. Uh, those of you who labor so faithfully, most of you behind the scenes, and you'll have the love of the Lord in your heart, and you've uh, chosen a lifestyle some of you have not chosen it, but it's been imposed upon you. But it's the lifestyle of the city, the lifestyle of the inner city. There really isn't anything quite like that. And as I have gone into so many homes, going after youngsters who have athletic prowess, I know the cities. I've been down those streets. I've been in those homes. But as of late, I've been traveling the cities to go in there uh, to come alongside my brothers and sisters in Christ and how rich, how rich it is to, to be in your presence. How um, humbling it is to have the privilege of talking to you. I'm sincere when I tell you that you're my heroes. It's the cities. It's the cities that are at the center of God's heart. God's heart is for the cities. And so, as this great movement of God's men continues to spread, it, it, it's surely God's heart to go all over the world. But I want you to know that it's the heartbeat of uh, promise keepers to first go with all of our efforts and all of our resources and all of our uh, great manpower and to come alongside you uh, in the city. That's, that's the real heartbeat of Promise Keepers. And so uh, we haven't seen the last of each other. Uh, not so long ago, in the early 90s, we were getting ready to play the Baylor Bears. It was a home game for the Colorado Buffaloes. It was a Saturday, much like today, just a little earlier in the fall. And um, what we do typically is we take our um, top 60 guys and put them in a hotel, even when we're playing at home. Kind of sequester them, get them in a captive setting, grab their focus, start giving them all the proper reminders and preparing them for the task at hand the following day. Friday night, it's not uncommon for us to go to a movie theater, take our team there, relax a little bit. And we did all of those things on this Friday night. But I had a surprise for my guys. When we got back to the hotel, I had arranged through a cable hookup to bring 
a championship fight to him in one of the rooms. It was a small room in this small hotel on campus, just enough to get 60 guys and a few coaches in this room, and we, it was tight quarters. But they were excited because when they got back from the movie, we had plenty for them to eat and then took them right up to this room, unbeknownst to any of them. And, and so the fight was just timed up perfectly. The fight was about to start. One of the fighters was black and one of the fighters was not. And I noticed, I sat in the back of the room behind the machine, the video machine that would bring the action, the TV hookup we had. And I had perfect vantage point. Uh, I kind of did that deliberately. And I noticed that as soon as they all realized who was fighting, that all the black guys were on the right side of the room as I was looking at the screen. They all sat on the same side. That wasn't that uncommon, but uh, typically there would always be a few white guys interspersed. We had, I didn't tell you, but we had roughly 30 black, 30 white on our team that made the trip to the hotel that night. And as soon as the fight started, I noticed that the uh, black guys were animated. They were excited. They were demonstrative. They were enthusiastic and spontaneous. They were coming to their feet all the time. And as I looked over at the other side of the room, the white guys were more laid back. And they, were, they hadn't all decided who they wanted to win the fight. But there wasn't any question uh, who the brothers wanted to win the fight. And, and the fight uh, went on, and it was it was one of those classics. I mean, there were a lot of fighting going on, and so it held everybody's attention. And as I sat back and watched the dynamic of this thing take place, I was so pleased with myself that I had arranged this because I could see that they were thoroughly enjoying it, and I liked the fact that my guys were all together in this small room. As the fight then drew to a conclusion, it became very conclusive to everybody in the room, including the TV announcers on HBO, that this fight had been won by the black fighter. It was going to go the full 15 rounds, and there would be a decision given, but everybody knew who won the fight. The announcers said so, and they were even, before they ever announced a decision, they were given their the, the new records of the fighters. And then there seemed to be a delay in the announcement of the verdict. And, and still there was a festive room that I had. But then one of the announcers said, you don't suppose that this fight could go the other way. And the whole room hushed. My whole room hushed. I mean, it hushed. And they stared in disbelief. And they announced the decision. And when they announced the decision, they announced it as a draw. And I'll never forget what I saw. Nobody said a word. There were no complaints. There were no gestures of frustration. There was no uh, animosity. You know what happened? The heads went down. And the brothers, when they walked out of there to a man, they just stared at the ground and walked out and went to their rooms. And um, white guys just basically didn't have a clue. And they, they didn't know. They didn't know what had happened. You see, what had happened was, one more time, the black guy found out that if I'm going to win, I have to knock them out. I'll never get a decision. And you know, I'm so thankful that I was able to go into those rooms and I was able to sit down on those beds and I was able to kind of come alongside those guys and I was able to say to them, um, I understand. I couldn't explain it to them. There were no words. I wasn't going to 
uh, try to conjure up something, but I just let them know that I understood. And, and when I went back to my room, I tossed and I turned because I knew that, that there was just this unsettling feeling that had come over the minority players on my team. And the next day, typically, before you leave the hotel, you just kind of get them all together and rev them up again and you go get to the stadium. You've already, on Thursday night, given them any fiery pep talk. You, you do that earlier in the week so that you can be sure that you've given them plenty of time to sort out how we're going to win this game. But I knew that that wouldn't be enough that Saturday. And so when I got in front of my team, I must have taken 15 minutes. And I explained what had happened the night before and the results of it. And I'm so glad I did because so many of the guys that didn't have a clue tuned in and, and stepped over and became part of the solution. And our team was cohesive that day, and I remember we won by a, a real big score. It was a, we had great morale. And we took that momentary pain, and we were able to still convert it into a, a team situation. But you know, I couldn't have always had that sensitivity. As a matter of fact, many times when I went into the homes of the inner city kids, I didn't have a clue. I would go in there and I knew what to say. And I had a certain sincerity to me. It was the favor of the Lord. Because Jesus was Lord and Savior in my life, but I didn't have a clue as to what was really going on. I was talking young men into coming into an overwhelmingly white environment and convincing them that this was the very, very best thing that they could do. But that all changed. And it changed like this. In the late 80s, we had a guy here in Denver, 40 years old, by the name of Teddy Woods, young black attorney, a guy that this community, many people in this community felt very strongly about. He had played football at the University of Colorado, and he was a good player there, not a great player, but a good one. And he had come here and, and had um, uh, really a wonderful reputation. He died suddenly and tragically of heart failure at the early age of 40. And when I learned that, I thought, you know, I should go to that funeral. I didn't know Teddy. I had met him. I didn't know his family or the community, but they knew me because I had been the football coach at Colorado for a length of time. And so when I made arrangements to go to the funeral that day, I got there plenty of time, but the church was already full when I got there. I would say that 95 to 98% of the church was filled with black people. And I noticed that right over in the right side in the very front pew, there was a, an open seat. And I was standing in the back where I came in and as I was looking for a place and I thought, I, I don't belong in the front row, but n no one else is standing and I don't want to draw attention to myself. And so I made my way around the back of the church and I slipped in and sat down right there. But the service didn't start right away. The music played on. And as I listened to the music, there was something in the music that was stirring something deep inside of me. And I, I really at first wasn't in touch with what was happening, but my eyes began to well up. They began to tear up. And, and I began to be a little bit self-conscious because I didn't want anybody to think that I was up here crying when I hardly knew Teddy Woods, and I didn't even know his family. And so, but the, there was a, a pain in the music. There was a grief 
in the music that went beyond the funeral. There was a woundedness. There was an oppression in the music that was breaking my heart up here. As I sat in the church, I became very uncomfortable. I couldn't hold the tears back. I kept thinking, they, somebody's going to see me and think that this is some guy trying to draw attention to himself. Some kind of a grandstand performance by the football coach, realizing that many of them probably knew me. But I began to sob deeply. Finally, the service started. But when the service started, it was unlike other services that I had been to. The pain was deeper. The grief was stronger. Oh, it cut through me like nothing I had ever experienced. It lasted a long time. I couldn't wait for it to get over because I was suffering. And I made up my mind as I sat there in that front row, I was going to come in touch with that pain. I left out of there, finally. And I grabbed everything I could get to read. And as I began to read, I began to start to come in touch with years and years and years of injustice, years and years of, of oppression. And then the natural thing for me to do was to start to go to black guys that I knew and, and to ask them about this and what was their experience and what were their roots and what did their, had their family experienced. And they couldn't talk about it. I couldn't understand why they couldn't talk about it. And I, I continued to, to probe deeper. And I started to get a clue. I started to understand. And it was right about that time, the Promise Keepers, where we had our first gathering. And what happened was 72 guys came together and agreed to fast and pray. I shared a vision that God had put on my heart that I believed that Almighty God wanted to bring men together in great numbers and celebrate the fact that a man's man, a real man, is a godly man. I wanted to offer an alternative to the world that thought that Christianity was a crutch and thought that a rugged guy, a macho guy, a guy who was always seen to be succeeding, that that was a man's man. And I wanted him to know that a real man had a spiritual depth to him. He's a humble and a gracious guy. Well, we agreed to fast and pray and see what God would do. And the word spread quietly. We had 4,200 men in Boulder, Colorado. The following July, a year later. And when these guys came in that day, perhaps some of you were there and you'll testify that what I'm saying is true. There was, is 4,200, it was the basketball arena, but I'm telling you, it was a supercharged environment. It was electric in there. I mean, it was exciting. It was as exciting as any of these events that I have been to at Promise Keepers with so many more men because it was obvious that Almighty God would pour out His Spirit if men would come together in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And so I gave my, I was the first speaker and I gave my testimony. I shared how Jesus had become Lord of my life. And we had several speakers that continued well on into the evening. And then it became my privilege to close out the program. And I was standing at the base of the stage, much like a stage, much like this one here. And I was just waiting to be introduced the last time and I felt like the Holy Spirit nudged me and say to me, what do you see as you look up at the men? And I said, Lord, I see guys that love Jesus and I said, it's exciting and I thank you because the power of the Spirit of God is in this room. He said, well, what else do you see? 
And I said, well, Lord, they're almost all white. Well, we had been challenging every guy that if he would bring 12 guys, one a month for the next 12 months, you just find one guy a month for the next 12 months, we could fill the football stadium next year. We can go from 4,200 to 50,000 in one year. Surely you can do that. Surely you want other guys to have this kind of an experience. And the Lord nudged me right there and said, you, you get up there and you tell them they can bring 50,000 in here, but if it's not a full representation of the body of Christ, if all the brotherhood aren't represented fairly here, you tell them I'm not coming. So I did. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, it was not popular what I shared. As a matter of fact, I got letters. People went on the radio and said, McCartney just violated scripture. Scripture says, when two or more gather in my name, I am there. And he just got up there and said whatever he felt like saying. Other people were antagonistic that I would get up there and share something like that. Well, promise keepers continued to grow. And it became my assignment that I would travel as an ambassador of sorts into some of the major cities and that I would share what Almighty God was doing with men. And you have to understand that full-time coach, not a preacher, but a reacher, I, I would um, have to go before the Lord long and hard before I could put a message together in, in the hopes of, of delivering God's heart. I have a prayer room at home, and I would go into the prayer room, and I would close the door, and I would get down on my knees, and I would beg Almighty God to share his heart with me so that I could go into these major cities and share his heart with men. And every time that I went in there for this message, the, Lord, the message the Lord put on my heart was, I want you to go around the country and talk about the oppression of racism. And as I would develop the message, as I would just be before the Lord, I used to weep. God knows this is true. I used to just, I used to just, sometimes I couldn't stop crying. I would just weep and couldn't hardly write. But when I got the message ready, I knew that I had heard from the Lord, and so I couldn't wait. The first place we went was Indianapolis. In Indianapolis, we met in a church, and I'm guessing that it was between 1,000 and 1,500 in this church. The men were there early, just like they had been in Boulder. And I'm, I mean, this, this actually happened. When I walked in and sat down on the stage, this is 45 minutes before it would ever be my turn to speak. The, there, there was so much excitement in the room. There was electricity in the room, and it was beyond anything you could describe. And I remember right there, a guy well over 60 years of age stood up and screamed loud enough for me to hear and anybody around him. And he said, Coach McCartney, this is the greatest day of my life. You see, old timers that had waited their entire lifetime to see men gather in Jesus' name. And when they introduced me, I got a five minute standing ovation. And then I spoke. And I spoke this message faithfully and obediently that the Lord had put on my heart. And so help me, when I finished speaking, not a single person clapped their hands. Not one. It was just stark, raving silence. I mean, it was sobering. And I went back there and sat down, and I was stunned. I mean, I was stunned. 
And I got home and I went right back to that prayer room. I got on my knees and I said, I said, Lord, where did I miss your heart? And the letters came in and the letters were from guys that had traveled two or 300 miles to be in that church. And they said, how dare you? How dare you have us drive all that way and you bring us that message? And I, I just really anguished and suffered. And then we went to the next city and the same thing happened. And then we went to the next city and I bombed again. And then we went to Portland, Oregon. And we were met at the airplane. There were a group of guys and they were really, really impressive guys. They were excited to see us and everything. And one of them quickly told me, they said, hey, we just had a Billy Graham crusade here in Portland. And the people with Graham crusades told us it's proportionately it's the greatest crusade in history. More converts, more accomplished in, you know, in numbers and whatnot. And, and furthermore, we don't have a racial problem in Portland. Everybody gets along here. And so I, you know, I didn't know any better. Uh, so, so I, I thought, well, this is going to be more fun this time. And so I got up and I shared that same message. And I got the very same response. But a guy walked up to the podium, and this was not rehearsed, unorchestrated. It wasn't part of the program. And he just stood here much like this, and he looked out over those men. And um, he was a very distinguished black man, I would say 60 years old. And big tears were coming down his face like this, and, but he, he didn't say anything for the longest time. And then you know what he did? You know what he said? He said, I never thought in my lifetime that I would hear a white man say what's been said here tonight. And then he said these four words. And when he said these four words, my life changed. My life has never been the same since he spoke these four words. I want you to know that. You know what he said? He said, maybe there is hope. And the Spirit of God came on me and validated me and grabbed me by the heart and said to me, been speaking my heart. You've been speaking from deep in my heart. And the Lord showed me, and he showed me ever since then. He, he, he showed me, he said, there's no virtue in you. There's nothing in you that qualifies you to speak for me. However, if you will be obedient, I will use you. Not long ago, I was, uh, I was riding a bicycle in the last month, and I was, uh, been traveling a lot, and I was, I was just out uh, trying to get some exercise, getting ready to go uh, to the East Coast to meet with minority clergymen. And the Lord spoke to me while I was riding the bike. And he told me, he said, there are so many pastors and others 
that are qualified. They have been faithful. They have walked with me. They've stayed with me. But I can't use them because they would be disqualified by others because of their color or because of their congregational affiliation. And he showed me that he could continue to use me if there was none of me in the way. If I were empty, if I were broken, if I were totally decreased, that he, he could keep using me. And he showed me that he could take me everywhere. But he also showed me if the flesh is in there at all, he can't take me anywhere. He can't use me. I'm of no value. I'm, I'm worthless. So, I'm really treading lightly, trembling before the Lord. But I want to say to you that what I see happening as I travel is white men are getting a clue. We are waking up. We are, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Things are changing. You need to know that God is doing something. You need to know that the spirit of the living God is moving across these great stadium gatherings and he is speaking to men. And, and the audiences are disproportionately white. But you see, God can use anything and he can turn it into good. And see, what's happening is as he is sensitizing the hearts of these guys as he's preparing them. He's preparing them for the revival that we're all asking for. And you are going to see things in your lifetime that you never thought you would see. You're going to see them. I ask Almighty God three questions every day. As a matter of fact, there is not a single guy per day, praise God, that I have failed to ask him these questions. And you know, every single day I am faithful to ask him these questions very, very early in the morning. It's spooky, really, because you know how when you wake up, you, you really shouldn't be held accountable for your first thoughts. <laughs> because you're just kind of coming out of a, the, a deep sleep or a dream or a nightmare and so your first thoughts are are really not necessarily yours I mean right I mean it could be out of your subconscious they could be anywhere anything you know what my first thoughts are almost every day before I even almost am coherent these three questions God has riveted them riveted them onto my heart. And the first question I ask Almighty God every day, it doesn't matter when I wake up, if it's two, three in the morning, because I, I never sleep the night through. I always wake up two or three times during the night. But this is the first thought, almost every night, but always before I get out of bed. Lord, what is your strategy to end racism? It's the first question I ask him. The second question I ask him is, I say, Lord, what is the direction for promise keepers? Where is promise keepers going? Is promise keepers going all over the world? Are we going to be part of helping rebuild the cities? The third question I ask Almighty God every day is, I say, Lord, if I get a chance to speak, what would you have me say? What could I possibly say that would have any value. I need to hear from you, Lord. Well, the Lord has given me the answer to those three questions. And I'm going to share it with you tonight. But I really believe he's also given me the answers 
to these questions. Can we truly see genuine unity? What would move God to do this? What can I do? How can we feed the poor? Who will be a father to the fatherless? What about the widow? Lord, why have you tarried so long? And when will the nations gather in Jesus' name? I'm going to share with you the answer. And when I do, some of you are, are going to just nod because it's just going to resonate with what God has shown you. And others of you, it's been my experience, are going to be disappointed. You're going to wish that it was something else other than what I'm going to tell you. But what the answer is, I'm sure of it. I mean, it's a slam dunk. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm going to share with you the truth. And you're going to hear it point blank. It's, the answer is, it's the most underestimated, the most misunderstood, the most neglected, and the most overlooked activity in the church. It's prayer. Now, I'm going to show, I'm going to explain to you why it's misunderstood. In Matthew 18, 18, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Are you in touch with the fact that heaven waits on earth? Are you in touch with the fact that every single one of us have a free will? And even though God has a perfect holy will, he will not mandate his will on us? Because if he did, then we wouldn't have free choices. We would only have the mandates of God. And he has told us that every one of us has choices, and we can make those choices, and we can decide for ourselves the destiny and the direction for our lives. You see, prayer is when we ask God to do what he wills to do. I believe that all across the world there are many, many, many people praying and their prayers are not heard. Some of these prayers are beautiful. They're flowery. They, they got almost everything in there. But there's some things missing. Here's why. In the same chapter, in the next two verses, Jesus says, Again I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. That's the verse that we've misunderstood. That's the verse that all across the world we have misused that verse. You see, what Jesus always intended was he would come in the midst of those who had come before him in harmony. He intended that those of us that invited him to come into our presence would come to him and we would be stripped. We would be open and barren before him. We would be saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will. Let me share with you a verse that everybody uses, but it's got to strike home. The verse is Psalm 51, 17. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. See, that's the verse. That's the person that Almighty God will not reject. It's the one whose heart is broken. It's the one whose heart is contrite. It's the one whose heart is desperate. It's the person who admits that they're depraved before God. They understand that the human heart is vile. It's wicked. Listen to this verse in Luke 14, 33. These are Jesus' words now. Any man who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. You see, when he meant everything, he meant every opinion, every suspicion, every judgment, everything that we've held against any other human being. 
in the world. We got to give all that over. We got to surrender all that. That's when Jesus will come in full power. Now, a spirit of prayer. A spirit of prayer is when we see into God's heart and we pray his will back to him. Oh, that CCDA would have a true spirit of prayer. You see, we all say that we want intimacy with Jesus. And here's what he offers us. He stands before us and he says, Into me, see my heart. He offers us the very intimacy that we want. But Jesus says, into me, see my heart, and ask me to do what I want to do. You see, I believe that heaven's got a great big backlog up there of things that Almighty God has wanted to do, but he hasn't done them because the church has never stood in harmony and asked him to do what he wills to do. The church is divided. Now, Matthew 6.6 6 changed my life. It's going to change your life too when you hear this. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, listen carefully now, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do you know what the reward is? Do you know what the reward is? When I tell you what the reward is, you can't ever be the same. Because you see, the reward is, is as you daily, regularly go before the throne of God and seek God, the reward is, is that he lets you every day inch closer to the very heart of God. It's life's choicest portion. It's what God always intended for everyone. He will give us his own heart. In Isaiah, the 11th chapter, the second verse, it says, The Spirit of the Lord will come on you in wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fear of the Lord, in power. That's what comes on the prayer warrior. That comes what's on, that's what comes on the person who's after God's heart, unrelenting, persevering, has to have the heart of God. It's life's choicest portion. Look at someone. Study the life of someone who is after the heart of God and only prays his will back to him. And you will see the very face of Christ on that person. You will see Jesus shining through. How many of you have ever thought about this? In every area of life, somebody has an advantage. For example, some people have greater intellect. Some people have greater economic base. Some people are more physically imposing. Some people are more physically attractive. Some people are the right color. Some people come from the right background, got the right roots. But listen to God's wisdom. Now tell me this is not the wisdom of God. There's one area where no one has an advantage. Everyone's the same. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter uh, what side of the tracks you come from. You know what that area is? Prayer. You see, everyone starts out the same in prayer. Nobody has an advantage. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what congregation you're in. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter how good your preacher preaches. You know what? It's up to you. It's, he gives us a choice. If we want him, we can have him. You shall seek me and you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, the Lord is looking for somebody who's not part-time. He's looking for somebody who has to have him. How many of you have ever thought about this? Who the greatest competitors are in this nation and across the world? I've been around a lot of great athletes, and I've seen some tremendous competitors. I mean, I'm telling you, they will bring it. And they bring it every time. But you know what? As I've observed, the greatest competitors I've ever seen, they're not athletes. They're not astronauts. You know who they are? They're prayer warriors. You know why? 
You know why? Because you see, they, there's no motive in it. There's no selfishness in it. It's totally selfless. Do you see that they only are after God to ask him to do his will? They have forfeited their own will. It's not about them. They go before the Lord relentlessly, unrelenting, persevering prayer after God's heart, interceding. How many of you have ever thought about this? Do you know that at 211 degrees, water is plenty hot, but it's not boiling? Do you know that at 212 degrees, water boils? How many of you know that at 211 degrees, a steam engine cannot pull a freight train of only four cars? How many of you know at 212 degrees, a steam engine can pull a mile-long freight train around a mountain pass? One degree makes all the difference. That's the way it is with those who pray. Moses prayed 40 days and 40 nights. He wanted the heart of God. Do you know that God prays? That heaven prays? How many of you know that praying is strenuous, it's intense, it's persistent? How many of you know that prayer is red hot? Do you know why? Because when we pray, there are three people there. We're there, the Lord's there, and the enemy's there. And the enemy has held forth, and he will not give in. And those of us that pray and just kind of daffy duck and dilly dally around and tiptoe around, and we think that our prayers are being heard, we got another thing coming. It's war, it's a real war. When you pray, it's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman that availeth much. Do you know why? Because it's a war. Listen to this, what was said about Jesus. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. But listen why he was heard. He was heard because of his reverent submission. You see, Almighty God, Jesus, wanted God's heart so bad. He wanted so much to do the will of God. He always, Jesus had a free will just like we do. He was fully human. But you know what? He wanted God's will. That's all he wanted. He always reverently submitted to the will of God. Great emotion, holy fear, equals powerful prayer. Lastly, this area of worship, how many of you realize that worship is something in our nation that we worship traditions, we worship people, we worship things, but do you know something? It God always intended he birthed in every human being that's ever been born a desire to worship. But you know what? It's always been God's heart that that worship would be reserved for him alone. God gave us that gift to go after his heart. God, every one of us have it. I'll close with this story. It's, it's a story out of Scripture. You remember, it was midnight. Paul was in prison. It was dark. It was deadly. It was dingy. He had been severely scourged. He was covered with blood. His body was gnashed and torn. His feet were in iron stocks. He was feverish. He was swollen, and he was suffering. Now listen to the account. And at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was an earthquake so that the foundation of the prison walls were shaken, and immediately all the doors were shaken, and everyone's ban was loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Why would he do that? He was being mistreated. He was being abused. Why would Paul, 
when all he had to do was let that prison guard take his own life, why would Paul scream and protect his life? You see, the apostle Paul had a spirit of prayer on him. He knew the will of God. He knew that Almighty God wanted to save that prison guard, which he did. He knew that his family would be saved. He knew that many of the prisoners would be saved. Let me tell you something about the Apostle Paul. After 25 years of ministry, do you know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, I'm the least of all the apostles. Five years later, after 30 years of ministry, you know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, I am the least of the least of all the saints. Do you know what he said the next year, 31 years? He said, I'm the chief of sinners. Paul was broken. Paul was broken before God. He was so broken, God could use him. He was so broken before God, God showed him his will. Paul knew the will of God, and he willed to do the will of God more than his own. E.M. Bounds wrote a poem. It goes like this. Thou art coming to a king. Great petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Our God is sovereign. Our God is holy. Our God is righteous. And our God is calling us to be broken, emptied, completely forfeiting everything before him. Those are the people that God's going to use in these days ahead. Those are the ones that are going to bring revival. Revival does not start in a crusade. It starts in one man, one woman's heart, as they are broken in repentance before God. Let's pray. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with him whose heart is contrite and whose spirit is lowly. To revive the heart of the contrite and the spirit of the lowly. Oh Lord, I pray that you would move throughout this great auditorium. And I pray, Lord, that you would grab every single one of us by the heart. I pray, Lord, that you would call all of us to be emptied before you. I pray, Almighty God, that you would have your way in our hearts. Oh, Lord Jesus, wash us one more time in your blood. May it be the prayer of our hearts. May every person in this room be able to say, it's the desire of my heart to be clean. It's the desire of my heart to once more forsake everything for Jesus. It's the desire of my heart, Lord, that you would have your way in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen.